Everybody, Pastor Darren here, and we're going to be diving into some stuff. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter uh, 1, and we're going to look at uh, uh, verse 6, 7, and 8. So again, Acts chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. Hopefully you guys are doing absolutely amazing despite everything uh, that is going on right now. Here, here's a question for you. Have you felt pressure lately? Okay, um, let's be a little more specific, right? Uh, perhaps it's a subconscious pressure. Like perhaps if I were to ask you, how are you doing? You'd be like, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. Despite the fact that everything's um, kind of lame right now, I think I'm actually doing pretty good. All right, now if you're in that category, let's call that category one. Uh, then perhaps actually what you're feeling is more of a subconscious pressure. So you're doing well. Your family's doing well. You can't... You can't really complain and yet um, from time to time, maybe throughout the day or, or at least maybe during the week, there is this moment where you feel like things are building up within you. It's almost like, it's like a tea kettle about to, about to whistle, right? Ooh, like that moment where you're like, I just don't know if I can do this much, much longer. And maybe you can't even necessarily blame anything specific, right? You don't necessarily know what it is that's bothering you but something is bothering you and the way that we uh, respond the way that we manifest uh, this pressure that for all of us it's different and the, the way that this pressure can manifest within us that can be different uh, from person to person let's break that down for a second um, we are in a lot of pressure right now not just um, as a city or a region that the world itself is in a lot of pressure right now and I would say that we all feel this pressure and so um, for some of us this pressure might manifest in our body and our bodies might be reacting in ways that they haven't reacted in in, in years. In fact, you might, you might have had different issues back in the day and, and now those issues are surfacing again and you, kinda, and you wanna know what's going on. Well, we do know that, uh, that stress is one of the main triggering agents that can cause um, ailments within our bodies to surface. So maybe you're watching this right now and because of this pressure, you are experiencing things within your, within your body uh, that, are the, that are either new, you've never experienced these things before, or these are some old things that are beginning to resurface. Or, or your health is great, right? Your health is great, and yet the way that this pressure is manifesting is within your own soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Ah! Right? <laughs> like how are you doing emotionally? And, uh, and maybe you're doing great and you can't necessarily complain about anything specifically. But there is this, this pressure, right, that's affecting us emotionally. And I think that uh, for a lot of people that, that, that might be one of the ways that this is manifesting. But then there's also, uh, we're a three-part being. We've got a physical body. We've got soul. But we've also got a spirit. And for some people watching this, um, this pressure might be affecting you spiritually, which means that you might feel vulnerable spiritually. You might feel susceptible. You might feel like there are these influencing agents. Maybe it's dreams. Maybe it's some sort of spiritual temptation. Maybe it's some sort of spiritual torment. Um, but perhaps there are things happening even in the spirit that, that, are, that are affecting you. If you find yourself in any of these categories, you pick the best service ever to watch online, a Sunday morning service here at Seattle Revival Center, because we're going to just begin our study by talking about um, pressure points, okay? Now, this first category that we, that we looked at, it's kind of like it's a subconscious pressure. There's not any one thing that we can necessarily blame, except for maybe COVID-19. But there's another category of people that perhaps are watching, and it's not subconscious. It's not this low current, stressful voltage that's running in the background, and you don't really know how it's affecting you, but every now and then, there are these moments where you're like, ah, right? No, like this category two group that you might find yourself in, it's like, you know, like your life has been specifically attacked in this time and it's not it's not low current it's blatant it's in your face 
you're overwhelmed and you know like exactly, you know, like, like for example, you could be like, I'm unemployed and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Like that's not some sort of low current subconscious thing. Like that is in your face. That's, that's a giant right there. You know exactly what's trying to intimidate you um, in, in this time. Now, uh, when it comes to pressure points, okay, um, you need to know this. You are not alone. Say it right now, okay? Say it right now. Just say, I am. Okay, hold on now. Some of you aren't doing it. Some of you aren't saying it. I know this is weird because you don't engage with Netflix, right? You just sit back and eat popcorn. But I need you guys to engage with me today, all right? Okay, so I want you to say, I am. So good, so good. All right, say, I am not alone. So good. All right. What makes what we're going through right now uh, unique is that the nations are being affected and that this shaking that we are experiencing, that it's not just shaking one isolated component within an individual's life. You see, sometimes when we're going through temptation, we can think that that specific temptation is unique to us individually, right? But um, what we're facing right now is not an individual um, issue. <laughs> that what we're, it, it's manifesting very in, individually and very um, intimately, right? The stuff that we're, that we're going through right now, the way that we're reacting feels very, very specific to us. But we've got to see this. The entire globe, the entire earth is being affected by this current shaking. All right. Now, when you do a study, we'll do a little study together of the seven influencing um, dynamics within a culture, oftentimes called the seven mountains, okay? Um, we see business, government, family, religion, media, education, and entertainment. We see these influencing societal um, uh, uh, mountains that tend to steer the culture, okay? Um, all seven of these influencing dynamics are being radically shaken. Check it out. The business, right? The marketplace. This place where usually the number one thing that, that gets, that, that, that attacks marriages and, and that can lead to divorce is financial issues, the loss of a job, uh, something, something happens. Listen, that the entire world, that the marketplace of the entire world is what? It's shaking right now. This isn't just an American issue. This is a global issue. We see when it comes to the government and there's a radical shaking, radical division uh, within our government right now, right? And there are these agendas within the government, agendas within the business place. How about when it comes to the family? We see that when we look at the trends, and we've talked about this before, when we look at what happened in China, one of the first countries that went through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, okay, that, um, that China went through this time of pandemic, and then as they came out of it, the next kind of wave that affected the country was a wave in families and we, we saw um, a, a, a record-breaking statistics in, uh, in marriages going through, uh, going through divorce. And so we see the very, the very institution of the family being attacked in this time, being shaken uh, by this. We also see that overall crime is lower than usual. But when it comes to domestic violence, that it's, that it's, higher, that it's higher than normal. The, the, the institution of the family being radically shaken in this time. We see even religion itself, the religious mountain, um, being radically shaken right now in that um, this is the first time in my generation, in my lifetime, where it's, where it's uh, been uh, illegal to go to church or illegal to host gatherings at church. That, um, that, you know, that maybe for the first time since our constitution was drafted, that, um, that, there, that, that there is not the freedom uh, to, to gather. Um, uh, how about media? The, the media mountain um, is, is, is perhaps thriving. 
<laughs> in this time. Uh, you say, what are you talking about? Well, when I look at uh, all the, diff the, the different stocks on the stock market right now, um, man, it's been a rocky, rocky place unless you own Netflix, okay? That, uh, that, 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 that Netflix and these different media uh, venues, even the CNN and Fox News and, and all their numbers are going through the roof right now. Why? Because we're not at work and we're not at church. We're on our phones. Right now, most of us are on our phones watching church on our phones. So media is one of those things where yet there's a shaking um, and yet the, in this time that we are seeing a resurgence in opportunity actually in, in media in an unprecedented way. Um, education. Uh, my kids haven't been in school since, since March, since mid-March. We just got an email from our principal last night that says, um, unless we get a miracle, your kids will not be in their classrooms this fall. Um, uh, uh, so when it comes to education, um, right now uh, it's been um, uh, um, uh, mandated from our state government that no children can fail their classes um, uh, this year because of COVID-19. So uh, we're, like, like education, th that's going to radically affect the grades that our kids are supposed to be going into next year. Um, what some kids know, what other kids don't know, what parents were able to homeschool their children, what parents just were not able to. And so when it comes to expectations in education, it's being radically shaken right now. Um, Media, and then the last one is entertainment. I just uh, kind of hit on that as well. Kind of blended the two, perhaps unfairly, but we do see uh, uh, entertainment and media right now are really, really thriving. People are turning to entertainment and media. Now, radical variances, a lot of diversity in these different cultural uh, influencing um, realms and spheres, but there is a similarity. Believe it or not, there is actually a similarity that, uh, between all seven of these cultural influencing realms. And the similarity, the thing that they all have in common is that they all have agendas. And within each one of these influencing realms are contrasting and competing agendas. And in this time of radical shaking and shifting and sifting, that within this time, we are hearing at an unprecedented volume, at a deafening volume, uh, uh, what uh, uh, these token agendas. And we're not just hearing these agendas. We're being invited to enter into them. Uh, parts of our own heart are being triggered in order that we would react to something that we're seeing, hearing, or experiencing, that we would react and that we'd find ourselves falling into agreement with a token agenda. And that's what brings us to the book of Acts. When you read the book of Acts, we find ourselves in uh, first century Jerusalem. We see that Jesus had, what, was born, uh, that Jesus lived, uh, that Jesus did ministry for three years. Um, Jesus was crucified on a cross. This was a moment of darkness, defeat. It was a moment of uh, just like, uh, talk about like the religious mountain getting shaken. Like this is, man, this is the end. It's the cross, it's the end. But wait, three days later, Jesus comes back to life. Jesus hangs out. He hangs out for 40 days. He's in public. He's engaging with people. Um, it's pretty crazy. And then we come to this moment. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 6, it says here, um, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, uh, Jesus uh, had come as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the one, uh, 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 the, not what just, he wasn't just holding one nation in his heart. He was holding the world in his heart. We see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It wasn't just for God so loved Israel. And yet, um, we see all these messianic prophecies foretelling of a Savior, a liberator, one that would come on behalf of, of Israel. So uh, Jesus was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be the Messiah, that Jesus claimed these things, that Jesus received worship, that Jesus it, like, like, was a very controversial figure. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a spiritual man, that Jesus was and is God. And we see at this point that uh, it's like they're saying, Jesus, 
We love the miracles. Jesus, we love all the supernatural stuff. Jesus, we love kind of your, your philosophy for rescuing and saving the lost. But surely, surely now is the time when you are going to gather your, uh, your, your new radical disciples. Surely now is the time when we, when, we get, when we bear arms and we rise up against this demonic antichrist um, Roman agenda. Perhaps it's at this time when Israel, the, the, the God's favorite nation, is going to stand up and, and is going to kick some serious butt. Like Jesus, right? Like now is the time, right, when you are going to be the revolutionary. We are ready. And Jesus responds and says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And then look what Jesus does. He, he, he refocuses them. This is what Jesus is saying. Your questions are revealing that your heart is out of focus. Why? Because you have tied me in with a narrative that is not, that is not in, um, uh, you have tied me into a narrative uh, that is not part of the Father's heart for here and now. That's what Jesus says. And look how Jesus refocuses um, the disciples. Look at how Jesus refocuses these around them. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. Not revolutionaries, not anarchists. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, there was at this time multiple Agendas, just like there is right now. There were uh, philosophical agendas. There were religious agendas. There were political uh, agendas. There were all these different factions and all these different groups. And the same thing is true even today, isn't it? That, um, that we believers, that we Christians, who, who even subscribe to the same kind of perhaps revival theology and, and worldview, that we subscribe to a lot of the same values and principles and even doctrines. But when it comes to the worldview by which we are seeing the culture, that a lot of us find ourselves part of different factions, different groups, even different Facebook groups, right? And we find ourselves in these different conversations. Um, and, and sometimes what happens is, is that we use our Christianity, we use our Jesus, we use our God in order to um, enable us um, to pursue this agenda. It's like we're using Jesus to empower us to pursue an agenda, but the agenda isn't Jesus himself. The agenda is, 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 is governmental. The agenda is religious. The agenda is political. The agenda is media-based, and we're using Jesus. We're using our Christianity. We're using our, our politics. We're using all of this stuff in order to further this thing um, uh, that, that we don't think is anti-Christ. We don't think it's anti-Christianity because I am a Christian. I, I do believe in Jesus. I, I read the Bible and all of this stuff. And yet the, my workings, the, the very thing that I, that I am living for, the very thing that I would die for, it's not Christ himself. It's this other thing over here. And here's what's happening right now. That, that within the season right now, there is an amplification of agendas. There, is all, there are all these lines that are being drawn in the sand. And they aren't lines like, like, choose you this day whom you will serve. Like, as for me and my house, we will serve. No, it's not about who's a Christian and who's not. In this time, it's like, it's like, like th there are these invitations of, of um, schools of thought, schools of philosophy, schools of, of what spectrum you're going to fall, uh, fall into um, politically. And we see that even here, that Jesus has, has come, he's lived, he's died, he's modeled, all this stuff. And these guys want to make what Jesus is about political. They want to make it about the uprising of Israel. And Jesus is like, you guys still don't get it. Like, I am about to empower you, but not so that you can overthrow Rome. 
I'm about to empower you so that you can bring the kingdom of God to earth. So that earth can look more like heaven and less like some sort of religious empire. That Jesus did not come to build a religious empire. Because if Jesus had come to do that, he would have spent his three years of ministry talking politics. He would have spent his three years of ministry talking about how to overthrow the political um, uh, agenda. He He would have spent his time discipling people into these cultural dynamics to, to, to whatever. But Jesus did not use his time, his energy. If anything, Jesus um, used his teaching to encourage people to submit to the Roman government, to even pay their taxes. This is a, a teaching that Jesus did. Like, like, hey, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. That Jesus was not anti-Rome. That Jesus was not anti-government. That Jesus was not anti all these things. And that is not how Jesus um, positioned himself. You're like, Darren, why are we talking about Jesus so much? Well, because we're a church. We subscribe to the Bible. And we believe that Christianity is not the same thing as being a Republican. We don't believe that Christianity is 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 the same thing as is uh, is some sort of some some sort of agenda. There's a very specific agenda to Christianity, and that is what we're talking about in this service. This place where we can untether ourselves from all the competing, contrasting agendas that would like to mask themselves as true Christianity, and that we would cut them off, right? And that we would get our focus back. And that's really what we're talking about um, today. That the factors, the forces, this influence, this pressure, this pressure that we feel building inside of us, this is not new. There is nothing new under the sun. That humanity faces different crises, different obstacles. And the size and the weight may vary, right? But the pressure, the the, the one that brings pressure, okay, that, that pressure that we see that pressure begins to be authored throughout the human story in cycles and patterns. And we can see that these patterns, they come and they go, but the strategy behind them is, is, always, is always the same. I'll prove it to you. We see first century Jerusalem, there was a group of people called the Pharisees. And they had boiled down Christianity into moralistic deism that was tied to the Old Testament, that was tied to the law. They knew all the prophetic words regarding the Messiah, and yet they were blind to the Messiah. They knew more about, <laughs> they knew more about the prophetic words pertaining to the Messiah than the very disciples who were following the real Messiah, and yet um, their religious pride blinded them from truth. Phariseeism. Guess what? There are so many Christian Pharisees today. Guess what? Even I wrestle with being a Christian Pharisee. Why? Because what is Christian Phariseeism? It is that place where we replace relationship with Christian philosophy. Where relationship doesn't matter. Why? Because we are leaning on a dogma to, to, to give us our blueprint for how we're going to handle each and everything that we go through instead of, instead of leaning into the tension, leaning into the issues, our issues that are clashing with other people's issues, right? There's, there's this place right now where many people believe that peace is the absence of issues. The problem with that is that the Prince of Peace himself surrounded himself with people with crazy issues. And so if we say that the that 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 shalom is the absence of chaos, then we're gonna totally uh, 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 miss the whole part in the book of Genesis where shalom, where the embodied shalom, that the spirit of shalom itself, that where Yahweh is hovering in the chaos and there within the chaos begins to create and begins uh, to, bring, to bring life. And so the Pharisees, they were, they were blind to the very truth that they were professing to know, that they were making these declarations, but they did not have the discernment to recognize the incarnation that 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 it, it was that their entire the, the entire realm of what they thought they understood that it was all contained within their head and their hearts were jaded by judgment and this is what I'm concerned about that within this place there's an invitation you Christian to 
to side with and to make a pact with and to become friends with an unrighteous judgment that would make people the enemy, right? That would make people that don't agree with you the enemy. That would make some sort of political party the enemy. When we know we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and crazy, creepy things and cosmic places. That this is what a pharisaical spirit does. It comes to affirm you in your religious conviction, and then it gives you justification for the division and the ungodly, unrighteous judgment within your heart towards people that don't believe the same thing that you believe, that people that don't share the same political opinion that you share, to people that see things differently, that it justifies us to make a judgment and to have division within our own hearts. That's a pharisaical spirit. And it has nothing to do with your theology. It has nothing to do with how you read the Bible. It has nothing to do with what kind of worship you sing. It has nothing to do with if you believe in the, in the prophetic or not. Some of the most crazy Pharisees alive today speak in tongues and they believe in healing and they're, they, they, they say they're part of the charismatic stream, but there are characteristics where within certain kinds of tribes there are justified judgments where we get to cut off people within the body of Christ and definitely cut off people that don't believe in Jesus or don't share our same opinion or worldview. The next thing I want to look at are a group of people in first century uh, 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 Jerusalem. They were called the zealots. And the zealots, for them, it wasn't about their religious agenda. It was about the political agenda. That the zealots were those um, who sought to, to raise up an uprising, a, a, a rebellion within the Jewish camp, an uprising against, against Rome itself, against Caesar. And there's this invitation. There is this agenda right now uh, of modern day the year is 2020 and an uprising of modern day zealots that would, that would say that, th that this is the, the one true political uh, framework, the one true way to think. And, and so we are going to rise up. And even if it means, um, and people are saying some crazy stuff right now. And I mean crazy. There's actually a spirit of crazy and crazy making that's behind some of the political stuff right now. And I'm not just talking about the radical left. Uh, I'm talking about the radical right, that things are, are, getting, are getting radically insane right now. And for us as the church, it is time to get our focus focus back. It is time for us to say, I'm not a Pharisee. I'm not a zealot. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I will not entangle with that, with those, with that, with that way of thinking. I will not entangle with those pressure points. And I've got enough pressure <laughs> that we are under enough pressure right now that the last thing that I need is, is, the, is that spirit of, 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 the, of that zealot um, where what it comes to do is it comes to justify anarchy and rebellion within our heart. And, and what it really, there's, there's this thing that when we begin to entangle with that, we will know, we will begin to justify distrust within our own hearts. And we will find ourselves distrusting everyone, including our own friends, including our own family, including our own church, including our own pastors. We will find ourselves, again, drawing the lines in the sand and feeling justified in doing so. Why? Because we have entangled with that system, that, with that political spirit, right, that comes to get us to, to, to fall out of focus to where it's no longer about Jesus and his heart for people and for the nations. It's now about our token way of seeing the world. And the third thing that we see are, you know, we think of Pharisees and Zealots, but within every generation, you will see a group of people that are radically disconnected from people. They're, they're, they're doing life, but they're, they're, they're doing it in radical isolation. Why? Because they're opportunists, and they are looking for brokenness in order to further their own agenda. And we certainly can see that within the various uh, seven mountains. And it's very important that we as a people in this time do not become opportunists where we use others, other people's pain to promote our own selfish desires. It is so important in this time that we are not, see, the problem with an opportunist is that's exactly what they do. They use other people's pain to promote their own selfish desire. What's selfishness? It's the very antithesis of love. 
Because what does love do? That love always comes to renew our focus, to bring us into this place of greater intimacy and awareness of the Lord and a greater place of empathy and compassion for people. And this is what true Christianity is. It is this place where we can love the very ones who are crucifying us. That Jesus, as he hung on the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hanging as a high priest, hanging as, as an intercessor, that on the cross that Jesus was not strategizing of, of a way that he was going to kill everyone, of a way he was going to get revenge. When Jesus was on the cross, he was not putting up a picture of Instagram saying, you see me here now, but I wouldn't want to be you tomorrow. That that is not the heartbeat of Jesus. That that is not what we represent. That that is not who he was. That is not who we are. And that is not who you are. We are not opportunists. And we do not use other people's pain in order to promote our selfish desire. It is our role as believers in Jesus to see all of our selfish desires crucified with Jesus on the cross so that we can use our lives to see other people step into the, into the discovery that they are radically loved, they are radically accepted, and that there is this beautiful love story, this narrative from heaven to be a part of something intergenerational, to be a part of something that is cosmic and, 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 and massive, to be a part, of, to be a part of, of something that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and will go on and on and on, this place of participating with the union of our Father uh, uh, and the Son and the Spirit to, to wake up to the reality of who we are and whose we are, that it is our, our invitation from the Father to be awakened to his love so that we can awaken other people to the Father's love. So the challenge is this, to not be a Pharisee, to not be a zealot, to not be an opportunist, to, 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 to not entangle with, all, with the competing, contrasting, political, religious, media agendas, but for us to get our focus back. And for us to say in 2020, no matter what happens, that Jesus, you are the prize. It is on you that we will set our focus, our gaze, and our countenance. And that we, we, will, we will not get distracted. And we will not get entangled into, into these into this, into this cycle of perpetual insanity that keeps us awake at night, that keeps us fighting each other, but takes us nowhere healthy and will bear absolutely no fruit. Phariseeism, it will bear no fruit within your life. The only fruit that you'll grow within your heart when you're a Pharisee is religious pride. And that will only lead you to a place of segregation and division and hatred towards humanity and eventually yourself. There's no fruit in being a zealot. There's no fruit in that place. There is no love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There's just there's just chaos and, and anger and, and resentment and this place that no matter how hard you work, no matter what you do, it's never quite enough. Why? Because the system is, is, is just perpetually messed up. And there is, no, there is no favor, there is no fruit in being an opportunist because you're living for yourself and you're not living for others. You're not living for the Lord. So then what do we do? What are we about? What's our message about? I like how Paul says it. He says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and to bring every person. Why don't you just declare this right now? Every person. Just say every person into the full understanding of truth. I think that it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to be a little more every person focused and not just one person, not just our person, not just my family, but that we would say that at Seattle Revival Center, what are you guys doing? That, that Christ Jesus is our message. We preach to awaken hearts that every person would be awakened to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. At Seattle Bible Center, this is our mission. This is our agenda. At Seattle Bible Center, we've got an agenda. We've got an agenda. We've got an agenda that we're willing to live for, that we're willing to fight for. And this is our agenda. Our agenda is to see people awakened to their identity, who they are, why they were created, to see people awakened to their identity and their destiny in Jesus Christ, that, that listen, here, here's the deal, that no matter who you think you are, 
that there is an opportunity for your heart to be awakened, that you can see yourself, not for what the mirror says about you, not what your doctor says about you, but that you can see yourself through the very eyes of the one who knit you together fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb. That you would realize that you weren't just, you weren't just the, 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 the effect of, of passion between your, your mother and your father, but that, that you were a God dream that in eternity past, he knew you, he knew you intimately, he created you for the earth for such a time as this. And you say, well, then how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, we remember that we are going to be a people that never forget that the Great Commission is our mission. And our mission is to see people awakened to their identity and destiny. But the second thing is this. Love is our ammunition. Just declare that right now. Just say, love uh, is my ammunition. And what does love do? Love receives. Love restores. And love reveals as we start to come back this summer, as we start to gather again, as we, as we go into the fall together as an entire church, you're going to hear us use this language a lot. This is our model at Seattle Bible Center that we'll be rolling out this fall. That, that this is what love does. That love receives. It's the picture of, of, the, of the father, of the, of the prodigal son. That when his son returned home, before his son could even repent, his father received him. And if you're watching here today and you feel like you're unworthy, you feel like, like God's probably pretty angry at you, you feel like no church would ever accept you, you feel like you've done a lot of bad things and whatever else, you need to know that Christianity is not a good person's club. That, that, that good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And we are all in need of forgiveness. And I think that this is the big thing, that as we're all reminded here today, that love is our greatest ammunition. And that what love does is that love accepts, love celebrates those who don't deserve to be celebrated. Love restores. What does that mean? That love doesn't just affirm people in their brokenness. That love restores people from a place of brokenness back into restoration. Listen, if my car is broken down, I don't want you just to come over and say, wow, that's a real special car. You've got a, such a special car. I'm just going to affirm your broken car. No, if your car is broken down, if my car is broken down, please don't affirm my broken car. Help me fix my broken car. Help me get my broken car back on the road again. That what this generation needs right now isn't more affirmation. We don't need more, ah, you're going to be okay. What we need in this time is the spirit of restoration. This place where we can receive people before they've ever been restored. We can receive people in their broken, messed up state. But then we'll partner with the spirit of love to help them get back on the road again. Partnering with the spirit of not rejection. Because you're such a bad person, because you've done all this stuff, I'm going to reject you. No, it's this place of because of what Jesus has done on the cross, I can accept you. I can love you. I can partner with Holy Spirit to see you restored. And the last thing is revealed. What does love do? It reveals us. It, 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 it presents us. I think of when I, when I married Andrea and, 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 and I hadn't seen her and all of a sudden um, uh, 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 she comes in th through the back of the room and, and her father was walking her down the aisle. What was her father doing? Her father was revealing her, uh, this bride, to all of our friends and family, everybody in the, there in the room. And Dawn, he walked his daughter down the aisle revealing, this is my daughter and whom I am well pleased. I am handing my daughter over over to you, young man. You better not screw this up, right? Like, I am presenting my daughter. This is what the father wants to do. He wants to present his bride. He wants to reveal his bride. He wants to take his bride down the aisle to present her before the earth to say, this is my bride. This is my daughter and whom I am well pleased. And you are invited to participate, to be a part of this beautiful bride that today he will receive you. Today, he will restore you. Today, he wants to reveal you. He wants to show you who you are through his eyes, through his 
proud Papa eyes. This is the part that always humbles me. That before I was restored, I still had a father that was proud of me. That before I ever got my act together, I've always had a Papa that was proud of me. And this is what every person needs to hear today watching. Whether you've been saved for 40 years or, or you're, you haven't yet subscribed yet. You haven't clicked subscribe to this thing called Christianity or Jesus. But this is what you need to hear. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you have a Papa who is proud of you. And he is inviting you today to be awakened to who you are. And that is a part of the family of God. And if this is resonating with you, then I want to invite you. I want to invite you. I want to dare you. I want to challenge you to invite Holy Spirit to come to awaken your heart. That you would be willing to say, Jesus, I received the kind of forgiveness that's only available through what you did on the cross. Jesus, I, I, I want to make you my Savior. I want to stop trying to save myself. Jesus, I need you. And if you're willing to say that, no matter how quietly, if you have just enough faith in your heart that you say, I believe in my heart, I confess with my mouth. I've been trying to save myself. Today I make you. This isn't about what I hear. It's not about, um, uh, uh, this is about you and Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is in the room with you right now. He's in the car with you right now. That it's 2020 now, but by the time you watch this, it might be 2030, 2035 that he is not limited by time or space. That even when you watch this video, I might even be an old man, but you still need to hear, you have a papa who is proud of you. And today, you can be united and reconciled to your father. Let's pray. Just pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, I've been trying to be my own savior. I've been trying to save myself. I've been a part of a, of, of, of a religion. And for me, family's been my religion. For me, politics has been my religion. For me, religion has been my religion. For me, entertainment has been my religion. I've used all these different things as vehicles of escape. I've, I've tried to find pleasure in so many things. But Jesus, I'm saying your name. And I want to hear you say my name. And I want you to listen now. And don't just listen with your ears. I want you to listen with your heart. And I want you to hear him say your name. Jesus, I'm saying your name. Now I want to hear you say mine. And I want you to hear him say, here is my son. Here is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, I want to trust you with my life. And I choose this day. I'm drawing a line in the sand that, Jesus, you will be my focus. And that I will fight for this focus. That love will be my ammunition. And that the Great Commission, this mission, it will be my mission. And I will not get distracted by counter-missions by counter-Christ, anti-Christ missions. But I will live my life in alignment with your kingdom mission. From this day forward, in Jesus' name. Amen.